The very first game console that I owned was the Game Boy Color. I don't own a Game Boy Color currently, but it's been on my wish list for something to replace. I do have a Game Boy Pocket here, and I gotta say, the nostalgia from seeing this startup is absolutely incredible. Rebuilding a Game Boy Color has always been on my wish list ever since I started this channel. With these older units though, we always just had a simple panel here, and it didn't really look great. We had a contrast wheel on the side, but the screen itself wasn't backlit. I still remember trying to play this in the dark, and that's probably why I need glasses now. You could use this port here on the side with a little snake light, and that's pretty much how you would play it at night. But rebuilding the Game Boy Color has always been on my wish list, and I think I found the perfect solution. Bunny Playing recently rebuilt the entire Game Boy motherboard using an FPGA core. This has been completely redesigned from the ground up. Getting one of these is pretty tough however as the website is completely out of stock. I did have to order one of these from the retro game repair shop and it was a little bit more expensive, but for me personally, you can't put a price on nostalgia. Today we're going to be putting this together and seeing how well this performs as a good Game Boy Color in the modern day. This does come with a rechargeable Type-C battery and we're going to put a new case on here as well. We also have a backlit IPS display and I think that's going to look fantastic. <laughs> There are a few subtle differences with the original Game Boy here. We don't have the IR reader at the top. We also have a volume rocker, which is used for controlling the menu and the brightness, as well as the volume. We have a link port up here and the power button on the side. The labeling on the FPGA core has been etched off. Aside from that though, the board looks fantastic and I can't wait to put this together. There's no serial number on my model here and I'm using the 1.0 board. There's also some gunk here from soldering, but I think that should be okay. Since we are building this Game Boy from scratch, we did have to source a few parts. The kit itself comes with the console motherboard, it does also include a battery and a speaker, and of course an IPS display. I did also have to get one of their proprietary cases, and I got this transparent red here I got some high quality buttons and I just decided to go with the black ones as well as some black rubber membranes and the black label for the back. You do have to use the shell specific to this kit. The shell appears to be in good shape and it comes with a few screws and a little cover here. So the first thing that we need to do is to get the buttons and the rubber membranes in. I got the buttons and the rubber membranes in there. Once you get those in, we can put the board in and double check the buttons to make sure they feel okay. We do also need to make sure that the speaker fits correctly. It's also going to come with this little rubber ring here. You can see that there is a part that will go inside. This ring should go around the top of the speaker here. This will prevent any rumbling of the speaker so you want to make sure that you get this on. You do want to make sure that this is slightly turned like this so that the cable comes down at the bottom corner here. With those in, we can next put the motherboard in and just to check to make sure that the buttons are working. So let's put the motherboard in and double check those buttons. It is a little tough to get this in as there's a post here, you have to make sure to put that on. There's also another small little post here to line up with the hole. Once you get those in there, it should be in place. Let's give a once over on the buttons here. B button feels good, A feels good, and the D-pad looks okay. The one thing I'm noticing is there's a little bit of space around the D-pad here and there's a little bit of space around the A button and the B button as well. I don't think that's really a problem but I just didn't expect to see that much space. The start and select buttons also feel good. They're a little small but I guess it's just been a while since I've used a Game Boy so I didn't expect them to be that small. The other thing that I just noticed is there is a small scuff here on the front so that's kind of disappointing and it came that way as well. I might reach out to Retro Game Repair Shop to see what they say about that, but that's kind of disappointing to see. Next, I'm going to put the IR shield in and the power button in. This actually proved to be somewhat of a pain to put in, but what I found worked really well was just using ceramic tweezers to hold it in and then push it down. For the cover on the power switch, you want to make sure that you put the top part with this little lip here at the top. 
Before we put any screws in, there are two kinds here. These smaller ones are for the PCB and the bigger ones are for the shell. Don't get these mixed up as you will wreck your shell. The three PCB screws, there's one here, there's one there, and one there. So let's go ahead and put those in now. At this point, I noticed that these are not pre-threaded, so it's going to feel pretty stiff putting these in. You need to pull these screws out once just to blow out the extra plastic from threading these holes and it should look a lot cleaner like this. Got the screws in there now and everything feels good. Let's connect the speaker next. There's a small cover here covering the speaker plug. Just go ahead and pull that out. Then connect the speaker. There is a small notch that sits up here at the top. Just go ahead and line that up with the hole at the top and go ahead and push that in. That should line up there pretty good, and it can just lay down like this. Now that we have those three screws in there and the speaker installed, we do need to get the back of the shell on here so we can put the battery in to test the screen. So let's go ahead and do that now. Make sure to remove the battery bay. Once you got the back on, there should be six screws that are left over. The six screws on the back are in the top corners, on the two sides, and there's two in the middle here as well. You're going to notice as well that these are tri-wing screws, so you're going to need a special screwdriver for that. I actually didn't even notice that, and I stuck a Phillips screwdriver into it, so you definitely want to make sure to be careful. I have two tri-wing screwdrivers, one from the Gully Kit Hall Sticks for the Switch. I also have an old one here that I bought a long time ago, and I'm not sure where I got this. So I'm going to try using these, and let's get those installed. Now initially, before I check the screen, I am only going to put two screws in. I'm going to put one here in the top left corner and one down here in the bottom right corner. This should hold the entire unit together just while we're checking everything else out to make sure that it works. We can now go ahead and connect the ribbon cable to the screen itself. My ribbon cable came pre-attached to the screen, so all I have to do is connect this to the unit. If you look really closely, there is a small latch here on the motherboard. I do recommend a pair of ceramic tweezers to pull this up, or you can use your fingernail as well. Once you've lifted that up, we can go ahead and install the screen. This might be hard to do on camera, but I'm going to try my best here. Now that we've got that in there, let's get the battery in and check out the screen. To get the screen into position, all you have to do is to slide it down like this. And there we go. Now let's flip it over and get the battery installed. I did notice from other reviewers that the battery terminals were pre-installed, but I don't have any on my unit here. So we can go ahead and just put the battery in as is. This comes with an 1800 milliamp hour 3.7 volt battery and this should last about 4 hours with full brightness. This should give us very similar results to a fully modded Game Boy. You do want to make sure that the PCB on the battery is on the right side then you can have the battery cable running along the bottom and the terminal to plug it in is right here. After trying for a good while to get that battery connector slotted in here I just pulled off the back. I could not get that in. And I think the reason why is because my battery connector has a small piece of plastic that sticks out in the center part here. Finally got that connected, the screen seems to be working fine. So now all we have to do is just to connect everything else and set it back together. When I started this up, the speaker did make some noise as well, so I know the speaker is working good too. Alright, so I got the battery connected and everything seems to be working, the buttons feel good. Let's try turning it on, and we know this works because I've already tried it, but let's give it a go. I gotta say, I'm extremely happy to see this working. The screen looks really good and vibrant as well. The power switch is a tad tight though, so I'm not sure if that's just because the back plate has been tightened too much. Yeah, that's extremely tight. I think we're ready to glue this down. One thing I don't like about this is how this is very visible here. But aside from that, it does look absolutely fantastic. And I'm very happy with how this turned out. On the side, there are some small quality control issues as well. Up by the link port, there is a small gap here. 
I'm not sure if this gap is persistent on regular Game Boys, but it's definitely visible here. The rest of the back of the shell looks good though, and I don't really have any complaints here. I did disassemble it again just to check this power switch as well, and yeah, it's just the power switch. This is definitely a very stiff switch. Let's put it back together and try a game in it. I do recommend disconnecting the battery before you glue down the screen just so you don't short out the unit. Now that I've disconnected that, let's go ahead and glue down the screen. The screen is pretty easy to slot in place. I was kind of worried that there was going to be a little bit of room in this area here, so you had to make sure to glue it straight, but this fits absolutely perfectly. So once you pull those stickers off the back and slot it into place, you know it's going to be absolutely perfectly aligned. Let's go ahead and flip this over. We'll pop out the screen, pull those adhesive strips on, then slide this back into place. To remove the adhesive strips, I do recommend pulling it directly out of the unit first because it's going to be really hard to get this bottom edge here. Now that we pulled it out, let's just peel these off quick and pop it back in. So what I ended up doing is just starting the corner with my fingernail, then I'm going to actually just use some ceramic tweezers to peel that off. Now we can go ahead and slot the ribbon cable back into place. Now for me anyways, this is definitely the scariest part of the installation because once that glues down, it's not coming off. Let's lift up the screen ever so slightly, put it down into place, and then finally let's just lay it down. And now that screen is permanently glued into place. Let's go down the sides very very lightly with our fingers just to get that glue started. We also can't forget that important finishing touch that completes the whole build. So let's put this on next. I am going to do this off camera as I definitely want to make sure that this is perfectly straight. If this is ever so slightly tilted, it's going to bother me to no end. Overall, I think that went on pretty good. I just lined it up with the bottom, made sure the sides were the same distance out, made sure the bottom was completely down, then did it like a hinge method and pushed it down in the center first before pushing it on the top. But I think that looks pretty good. Overall, I'm really actually quite happy with how this looks. We also need to get the plastic off here. Nice. And that was obviously the best part of the entire build process. First off, let's try the Pokemon Yellow games that I have here. This English one is a fake version of Pokemon Yellow, so we'll try that first. Then after, we'll try an official cartridge. This is the Japanese Pokemon Yellow, so this one should work. That slots into place nice. And now let's try turning it on. And the game starts up right away. We are getting some graphical glitches here, which can be easily fixed, I believe. So let's try fixing that. All we have to do is bring out the menu and swap this over to Game Boy, and it should work fine. Then just go down and save. Then we have to restart it. I gotta say this power button though is absolutely too tight. Let's give it a new game and that should be fixed. Nope, it's not. I haven't updated this firmware on this screen either, so that might need to be updated. Quite a few different screen modes. It could also be this frame mix option, so let's go ahead and shut that off. Let's go ahead and hit save, and let's restart the unit one more time. Nope, so it's having the same issue. This is not really good to see. I'm also going to try setting it to the Game Boy Color Core with the frame mix off to see if that fixes it. I'm very impressed with the screen quality though. The screen is very bright and vibrant, so if we can get this little glitch fixed, I should be pretty happy with this. Nope, this could also be because we're using a fake game, so let's try using an official cartridge and see if that fixes the issue. We got the Japanese version here, so let's see if that works. So the sprites definitely seem to be working on the official cartridges. So this is likely just a problem with using fake cartridges in this machine but everything else seems to be showing correctly here, and the speakers sound amazing. We can also try a ROM cartridge just to see if that works. I just have one of these generic game color cartridges here, so let's see if this works. Well, I loaded up Pokemon Red here, and it didn't seem to have any issues. Oh, never mind. Yes, it does. Let's try Pokemon Yellow to see if it does the same thing. I've loaded up the same Pokemon Yellow on my ROM cart here, and it seems to be working so far. All the sprites are showing up correctly. Let's just skip this first part here and get to the map to see what happens. Now that I'm out of the intro, it seems to be working fine. 
The only thing I'm noticing is the A, B buttons here. There's a little wobble to them, but that's pretty normal. And the D-pad also has a slight amount of wobble as well. To get that menu up, all you have to do is push in the side option here, and you can control them with the A and B buttons. So we can turn down the backlight, and that gets pretty dim for night. And you can turn that up all the way. We have a couple different display modes. We got full 4XP, which replicates the original Game Boy screen. 4X, which gets rid of those pixels. I'm gonna leave it on full. We can change the core. We have a couple different palettes here. Those don't seem to be doing anything on this ROM cartridge. We have the frame mix, which I'm going to leave off. And we can also control the clock speed. We also have the version of the screen itself here as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and click save. And it does show us our battery levels too here. To get rid of the menu, all you have to do is push this in again. And we can control the volume with the up and down. The speaker actually gets very loud too. And it's very clean. When adjusting the volume, you can't just hold it to go up or down. You have to press it every single time, but that's okay by me. Well, I'm really happy how this turned out. I think this is a pretty cool little device, and it's nice to finally have a Game Boy Color again. Building a brand new Game Boy Color with brand new parts for a fraction of the cost of getting a modded one was a really cool experience. Because there's no soldering required, this made this very easy to put together. It does have some compatibility issues, but it does seem to be working with this ROM cartridge that I have. The power button is a little stiff, but I'm not too worried about that. The speaker and the screen are great. The build quality also seems pretty good, but there were a couple different quality control issues, as we saw when putting this together. Upon closer inspection, you can actually see some screen uniformity issues. Around the center part here, there's a brighter spot than around it. I don't think this is per se anything to do with what's behind it, but this is definitely disappointing. A lot of people are going to liken this to the analog pocket. And if you look at the screens, there's definitely a difference between the analog pocket and the FPGA kit. This is with both screens on max brightness, and you can see the analog pocket gets way brighter. The FPGA kit though doesn't look too bad, and the colors are very nice. However, compared to the analog pocket, the FPGA kit just can't keep up. Pricing wise though, the FPGA kit came out to about 200 Canadian delivered. The analog pocket though came out to almost 430 Canadian. There is definitely a huge price difference between these two consoles, so it really comes down to what's good enough for you. This is my favorite form factor for a handheld. As the very first console that I had growing up was the Game Boy Color. And I do think that both of these do an excellent job. It's a shame about the quality control issues on this screen. The analog pocket is definitely my end game for a vertical handheld. And I'll have a full review coming up on it soon. What do you guys think of these two units? Which one would you pick? And is the FPGA kit good enough for you? Let me know in the comments below. Have you already built yours? Let me know your building process and if you had any issues with your screen. I was about to call this review done, but unfortunately there's a very audible hiss on the speaker. It almost sounds like a small fan and it's very distracting. If I was to play this at night, I would definitely notice that. But if you have the volume up, I don't think that's going to bother you. Hopefully this gets fixed in future firmware updates, but I'm quite disappointed to see that. It's also a shame about the uniformity issues on the panel itself too, so this is definitely not perfect, but it has a lot of potential. If you have any questions regarding the kit, make sure to let me know in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, and as always, thanks for watching.